Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Devlin, and I um, I got invited by GZM to give a, a guest lecture today. So what I wanted to do was um, was record it. <laughs> well, the whole idea with the uh, with the FaceTime was simply so that you could actually see that there's a real person here, as opposed to just a disembodied voice. But in any event, we'll we'll skip that. It, I want to talk to you today a little bit about consumer neuroscience, and um, I thought what I would do is start by how I got involved. So I'm a, a professor of cognitive neuroscience at UCL, and for 20 so years I've spent my career doing really kind of ivory tower research, looking at you know how language works in the brain, what's different in our brains compared to other primates that allows us to use language in this kind of a way, um, those kind of things. But as part of my role at, at UCL, I'm the director of um, an MRI center there. And over the years, I've had a lot of interesting approaches from companies asking me questions like, can you use um, neuroscience to prove that pudding makes your brain happy, for instance? Or can you use MRI to tell whether or not this Coca-Cola ad is going to be you know, successful? Um, I've been asked about using brain imaging to, to predict the outcome of elections. Um, and um, perhaps my favorite uh, among lots and lots of different requests that I've got was one group came and said, look, can we bring a live tiger into the scanner um, and use it to show what anxiety in a subject's brain looks like? <laughs> and, you know, you might imagine that these um, are all sensible from one perspective, but from my perspective as a, as a neuroscientist, these are kind of crazy questions. I mean, the answers were no, 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 and what? Are you kidding me? Um, no, you can't bring a live tiger into my scanner. Um, so for a long time, it took, um, I had the impression that what companies, what corporate and industry wanted was so wildly different from the kind of things that we could actually do in science that there really wasn't much of a, a bridge between the two of them. It was very hard to, to bridge that gap. It took a project with um, an advertising company called JWT to, to really change my mind about that. So back in 2014, I believe it was, uh, JWT approached me because they were hosting the APG conference called Big Thinking on Strategy. So I gather there's every year there's a, a, a strategic um, conference for planners in, in advertising and who hosts it rotates um, rotates around the participants. So in 2014 it was um, AP, uh, it was um, JWT's turn and they wanted to do something fun and creative with um, advertising their their conference. So as I said, they came to me and they said, look, would it be possible to put some of our um, keynote speakers in a brain scanner, have them think about their their talks? And we could record their brain activity and generate some images that we could then use to um, to promote this this conference. And that is a very easy and sensible thing to do. Of course we could. So what happened was they brought in um, uh, several of their their keynotes. One was Guy Murphy, who's a, a strategist at um, at uh, JWT. Another was Sir Lawrence Freeman, who um, is actually. Um, um, uh, an academic at, at King's, um, and we put them in the scanner, we asked them to think about their, their talk content, we actually gave them something to, to do in contrast so that we could compare what was happening in their brain when they were thinking about their talks. But the point wasn't, like, what did the activations look like, what was happening in their brain? The point was to generate the images that you kind of see in front of you, right? So we could see, you know, what's happening in Guy Murphy's brain when he thinks about strategic planning or what's happening in Sir Lawrence Murphy's or Sir Lawrence Friedman's brain, excuse me, when he's thinking about the history of strategy, etc. And these were ads that then ran in print in the Guardian and you can see that what the what the company did was they adopted a quite a medical font um, and uh, this sort of style that they used not only for these these print ads but they actually used it for all of the visuals at the at the conference, including the sort of printed handouts and uh, you know information about the um, the conference, the schedule, etc. Um, um, they also did a social media campaign where they had APG Big Thinking uh, being the the hashtag, and basically anytime anybody used that hashtag, they got a personal tweet back that said, um, you know, you've you've 
just tweeted about this and your perspective was comes from memory, it comes from emotion, it comes from whatever it is, decision making, and this is a part of the brain that's important for memory or decision making or whatever the case may be. So people were getting these kind of um, personalized brain response images and pictures back um, in response to their tweets and it was it was a really popular kind of thing. At the time I had um, perhaps too much faith in, in, in the tech solutions. I just assumed that they had written a little bot that would do this. But in fact, what they had was Ben, the intern, sitting in the corner, responding to everybody's tweet personally, which was, um, which was amusing. I enjoyed that. But what was, um, what was fantastic about that approach was it really changed my thinking on the relationship between um, business and, and neuroscience. And I could start to see where, you know, there was a space for a legitimate kind of consumer neuroscience. In particular, one of the things I, I learned that probably should have been obvious, but had been obscured by tigers in the scanner and things, was that there's a ton of super bright people in industry who don't have a science background, but who are really interested in these kind of issues. And it's very, very hard for them to get accurate information about what you can and can't do with neuroscience and what can and cannot offer their businesses, right? So as part of that, it led me into the path that I'm, that brings me here to you today. But, um, you know, one of the things I started doing then was running these workshops for industry um, around what consumer neuroscience can offer, what the good and the bad of consumer neuroscience is, and how you tell them apart. Um, and how do you separate those sort of facts from the myths um, that are so prevalent. Because really, the only way to do it is either to go out and get a whole degree in neuroscience, which seems like the kind of effort that most people won't be able to do, or you have to go to the companies who are offering these kind of consumer neuroscience solutions, these neuromarketing companies, and just accept what they say at more or less on face value. And neither of those seems like a really optimal solution. So what are the right answers for the people like yourselves who might be interested in this topic, but of course don't have the time and effort to, to spend um, going out and getting a whole neuroscience degree yourselves? So that's kind of the motivation for my, my talks today. I'm going to actually break it into two. So this first half will last about you know 40 minutes or so. Um, and then there'll be a, a break, um, and I'll record the second half. Um, obviously, how you watch them is up to you, but I just thought it was easier than going through sort of a marathon sort of two-hour session. So part of the motivation behind the idea of consumer neuroscience is this great quote from David Ogilvy, right? Consumers don't think how they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. Now, he's not trying to suggest that consumers are perverse people who are out there trying to get you. That's not the case, right? The problem is that consumers don't always know how they came to their decisions. They don't know exactly what they feel about a product, or they're not very well able to articulate what they feel. In addition, um, although they probably would be happy to answer your questions about these things when asked, one, they don't have the information, but two, sometimes being put in that situation introduces social biases which affect the way they answer. So that is to say, you know, there's pressure on them to answer in particular ways. Whether or not you intend that, it doesn't matter, right? The important thing is when you ask people in sort of a, a traditional focus group approach, <clears throat> there are limits to how much of useful information you can get out of it. There's no doubt focus groups provide important access to consumer information. The question is, do they represent all of the information or do they only represent some of it? And I think that the consensus pretty much among everyone at this point would be that um, focus groups only represent a sort of select uh, window on some of that information. There's a great deal more information that you could potentially get. And the question would be, how do we do that? How do we leverage these tools to work beyond a focus group? Now, some of the basic science that comes um, that that explains this comes from a guy named Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel um, Prize in Economics in um, I think it was 2000, but it might have been 2001. Um, and amusingly, uh, Danny Kahneman is a psychologist, not an economist, um, which to this day still annoys a lot of economists who don't appreciate psych people taking their Nobel prizes. But um, what, what he did was he spent his whole career, and he's still alive and still doing this, by the way, um, studying how people make decisions. And he summarized this in a book 
that was very, very popular called Thinking Fast and Slow. Many of you may have read it or have at least heard of it. What I would say is it's an excellently written book. It's got a lot of detail and it's really, really good. So if you get a chance, I highly recommend taking the time to actually go through and read it. I think you'll enjoy it on top of learning a lot out of it. But to just sort of briefly summarize what his main point with the book was, is that Kahneman has argued that you have two different ways of thinking, which he calls System 1 and System 2. System 1 is fast thinking. This is heuristic-based, uh, rules of thumb, it's got all sorts of biases, um, but the thing is, you do it really quickly without a whole lot of effort. In contrast, System 2 is the slow, methodical, rational, weigh up the pros and cons and come to some sort of weighted decision that you can use to produce uh, a, sol a solution. Um, this is the way that people think that they make decisions for the most part. <clears throat> but the reality is, a vast majority of what you actually do is fast and, and without a whole lot of effort. And there are different circumstances, right? So when you're in the grocery store and you're just buying um, your favorite um, um, toilet paper or, or toothpaste or something, odds are, in normal times, you just simply walk up to the shelves and you, you grab the one that you normally buy and you walk away and you don't really think about it a great deal because there's no real point sitting there deliberating, my goodness, what are the pros and cons of Crest versus Colgate? There's just no point to that. So, um, but that may be different when you make other kind of purchasing decisions. When you go out to buy a car, you may very well sort of be much more careful about weighing up what the pros and cons of your Toyota Yari versus your Honda Accord are, right? I mean, because you're going to put down a significant amount more money, it's probably the case that it's a more important decision for you, and therefore you're more likely to spend the extra effort to go through the pros and cons effects. But these two systems constitute the way that our decisions are made, right? And the reality is that system one, that's making the majority of the decisions, is opaque to us most of the time. When you ask somebody how they made a decision when they used their sort of fast automatic solutions, they often are good at making up a story about it, but they're not always aware of how they really made that decision. And that's that has been Kahneman's life work. How do we measure how people really make these decisions? And why is it that, that people are so unaware of how they make these decisions? How does that develop um, and how do we understand it given that it's so hard to just ask them about it. So even though you may not be aware of how you made the decision, you still did make the decision and it happened in your central nervous system. And that's the key insight behind the idea of consumer neuroscience or neuromarketing. That is that we can use the tools of neuroscience to investigate um, the, the brain processes involved in for instance, consumer decision making. Now, I should add that consumer neuroscience obviously focuses on consumers, but it's not limited to that. You can still use the same tools and approaches to understand, for instance, how your employees are making their decisions and um, are, you know, benefiting from your decisions or or otherwise. So, um, it's not only limited to a marketing kind of context. So, uh, although I'll tend to use the terms consumer neuroscience and neuromarketing. Um, interchangeably, what I mean is the whole broad picture. I don't mean just literally a consumer actually buying something at this moment. And I'll give you examples that are come from lots of different areas. So one of the early people to adopt this kind of neuroscience approach to understanding consumers was a man named uh, Patrick Remboise. And I apologize for my pronunciation, obviously you can hear from my accent, I'm an American, so I'm probably going to slaughter a few people's names. My apologies, I'm really sorry about that. But I have this video from Patrick that I'd like to sort of share with you because I think it's a nice illustration of some of the, uh, some of the ways that consumer neuroscience are presented. So let's see. In this class, we're going to teach you about the brain. We're going to teach you how your customers use their brain to make buying decisions. We've learned from neuroscientists that when your customers decide they don't use one brain, they actually use three brains. So this is a little model here, and here is what happens inside the brain of your customers when they make a buying decision. The first thing they do is they use their neocortex, and the job of the neocortex is to give you your rational thinking about that decision. So before you decide, you say, what do I think about the decision? In fact, that's the reason why we're called homo sapiens. Homo sapiens in Latin means the ones who think. Why? Because we think more than any other species on Earth. 
Because guess what? The neocortex is just a decision influencer. It is not the decision maker. It has a vote, but it is not the one that makes the ultimate decision. The second brain that we use when we decide is located here, in what's called the middle brain. And the job of the middle brain is to give you your gut feeling. In other words, first you go, what do I think about the decision? And then you go, how do I feel about the decision? But the middle brain is also only a decision influencer. Neuroscientists have demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that whenever you decide, whenever one of your customers decide, we always use that section of the brain here, which is called the reptilian brain. So this brain has many names, actually. People call it the first brain. Sometimes people call it the old brain. Sometimes people miscall it the limbic system. It doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is that we use the most ancient part of our brain to make all our decisions. There is a good news and there is a bad news. The bad news is we decide at the level of a crocodile. Why? Because the reptilian brain, as its name indicates, is a brain that we share in common with all reptiles. But what's truly remarkable is that if you think of those three brains, the rational brain, the emotional brain, and the instinctual brain, what's really amazing is that although we live in the 21st century, we human beings still use our reptilian brain more than we use our neocortex to really trigger decisions. I like this video um, for a couple reasons. Um, one is that I think it actually captures um, a, the, the state of consumer neuroscience pretty well in the sense that this is a, a video that has um, uh, a number of things that are, that are true, factually accurate, um, a number of confusions, things that are a little bit inaccurate but could be accurate if they were just adjusted slightly, and then a few components that I would basically consider more alternative facts, that is things that just aren't true. Um, and that's characteristic of, of this whole field. The whole field is awash in a mix of things that are true, confused, and for lack of a better word, just straight up false. They're incorrect. They're myths. So um, what I'd like to do in the first instance is go through some of these. Um, and to just be concrete here, um, you know, when you talk about the idea of having three brains, uh, that's what I would consider a confusion. There's no doubt that you do have a brain and that that brain can be divided in lots of different ways and that the ways that Patrick has divided it here are probably fairly sensible. You could divide it into those three, um, although he missed another section called the cerebellum, which would represent a fourth part of the brain and it does certainly have an awful lot of uh, brain cells in it, so it was strange to miss it out. But um, but in addition, when he talks about you know making decisions at the level of the reptilian brain, um, that's actually just false. I mean, and scientists, neuroscientists would say, would beyond any reasonable doubt, that that's just not true, right? We do have a part of our brain that you could call the reptilian brain. It is the evolutionarily oldest part. It's called the brainstem. And we do share it with fish and crocodiles and birds and things like that. Um, that part of the brain is doing very low level functions like keeping your eyes moving, keeping you breathing, making sure your heart keeps pumping and keeping chemical levels in your blood correct and things like that. So the reason that we share it with all those other species is because it's essential to maintain life, right? If you want to have a complicated um, physiology like animals, fish, birds, etc., then you need a nervous system that's capable of keeping track of the physical environment, both internally and external to the, to the creature, and doing the basic things that are necessary to keep you alive, like breathing. So I suppose if you want to consider, like, do I continue to breathe a decision, then yeah, sure, you make that at the level of the, uh, the brainstem. In contrast, if you're going to make a decision like, should I buy Colgate or Crest, that's absolutely not happening at that level. And it is absolutely happening at the level of the neocortex, that area shown there in blue-green. Um, and we'll talk about that as we go along today. So what I thought I might do is just start with some information about the brain, because it is a really, really remarkable organ, right? So I'm showing you the brain from the left side here, and um, the four hemispheres of the brain, or excuse me, <laughs> now it's my turn to make confusions. The four lobes of the brain, shown on the left hemisphere here, um, are in different colors, right? So 
Overall, you have about 86 billion brain cells, nerve cells, neurons in your brain. Um, and that's an incredible number. It's, it's really hard to envision it, but it's worth noting that you have more brain cells than the queen has pounds. Okay, so if you ever happen to meet Her Majesty, definitely bring that up in conversation because you have more brain cells than she has wealth. <clears throat> the nice thing about each of those brain cells is that they talk to a whole large set of, of other brain cells, and they do this through these little, um, what are called white matter fibers. They are literally wires that connect um, the brain cells together. If you were to lay them out end by end, um, a healthy 20-year-old has about 160,000 kilometers of white matter fibers in their brain, which again is just a crazy number. That's enough to wrap around the earth four times or to take you halfway to the moon. And you're carrying that all around in about a kilo and a half of mush inside your skull, right? So it's only 2% of your body weight, but that brain, all these nerve cells and the fibers that connect them, is using an enormous amount of your body's energy. Somewhere between a fifth and a quarter of the, your body's energy goes to supporting your brain. And that doesn't matter whether you're awake or asleep. If anything, the amount of energy that goes to support your brain goes up when you sleep. So most of us think about turning the brain off right, when we go to bed, but the reality is um, the activity in your brain actually increases when you're asleep. So it's a remarkable organ, um, and there are a lot of things that you know people know about it. So one of the things is that we do have two hemispheres. You have both a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. In general in this talk I'm only going to show one at a time because it, it they look very similar to each other but also because it just makes the, the images a little bit more complicated um, because they're basically mirrored in the two hemispheres. But of course one of the things that people know about the brain is this idea that the left hemisphere is your rational mathematical, engineering, logical, precision brain, whereas your right hemisphere is your creative, emotional, artistic um, brain, right? And this is this kind of thing that comes up all the time. It's illustrated in this kind of a graphic. You even see it in neuromarketing, right? So this is a Mercedes-Benz uh, print ad that ran in the UK quite a few years ago where they're playing on this, this idea that, you know, driving a Mercedes-Benz appeals to your left logical engineering brain and, the, uh, and also to your artistic, you know, emotional, creative, power-loving brain. So you benefit not only from the, the high level of engineering and control in the, in the Mercedes, but also from the sort of amazing leather seats and the power of the car and the, you know, the, the joy of riding it in it, right, or driving it. So this is just a myth. This idea that you have a left and a right brain that are doing basically different things um, is, is false, right? And you see it all the time in, in neuromarketing. And in fact, it's one of the, the, the warning signs that you should always be looking out for with neuromarketing is anytime that the marketing itself relies on actual brain myths, they can be seductive and they can be interesting, but they're just false and there's no validity to it. For instance, there's no difference between, you know, riding in a Mercedes in terms of your left and right brains than in a Skoda or riding on a, even a unicycle, if that's what you want to do, right? In both cases, you're going to be using both your left and your right brains, um, no matter what. And in fact, one of the things that's actually true about the left and the right is that the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. So anything that you're doing that requires basic body control always is involving both left and right brains. So another thing that comes up all the time is this appeal to the idea that men and women have different brains. And it turns out that this is true. There are significant differences between male and female brains, but they're almost never the kind of things that people are actually trying to focus on. So for instance, let's just dive into this. This is a picture of a human brain shown sliced from the front. Um, it's what's known as a coronal section. Um, and the arrow is pointing to an area in the brain called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the largest set of white matter tracks connecting the left and right hemispheres. And the reality is that the corpus callosum, on average, is denser in women than it is in men. Now, you can't see this on an MRI scan. It doesn't have the sort of resolution that you need. But if you were to actually do histology, that is to say, look at the brain under a microscope and count the number of fibers, 
on average, you'd find that women have greater fiber density here than men. What does that mean? Well, at the moment, I don't think anyone has any idea what it means, right? So there's all these stories that it means that, therefore, <clears throat> women have better connectivity between their left and the right hemispheres, which, as we know, are doing totally different things, which means, then, that women are better multitasking because they can use more of their brain, <coughs> excuse me, more of their brain effectively. That's just nonsense. That's a kind of whisper down the line argument. Um, so it started with a fact that was true. There is a density difference between men and women, and it's moved on to conclusions that are obviously false and that aren't substantiated in the data. <clears throat> there are chemical differences in male and female brains as well. <coughs> I'm sorry, I seem to be losing my voice here a little bit. Um, so, for instance, and perhaps not surprisingly, there are hormonal differences. Um, in most women, estrogen levels are higher in women than they are in men, but that's not true of all women, and it depends on a couple things. So, first of all, it depends on where a, a woman is in her cycle. So, there are parts of the cycle where estrogen levels actually go down fairly low, but they don't stay there for very long. And postmenopausal women, sometimes, um, particularly who aren't on hormone replacement therapy, um, can have lower levels of estrogen than, than some men. So this is true on average, but it's not true in, in detail. And then another one that comes up all the time is, on average, men have larger brains than women. So I mentioned that mostly human brains are about a kilo and a half, but the, the reality is that it's slightly less than that, and that male brains are about 1.4 kilos on average, whereas women's brains are about 1.3 kilos on average. That's just a fact. It's not a, a statement about value. It's not until somebody says, well, okay, th but clearly bigger brains are smarter, right? And that obviously is a myth. I'm sure all the men in the room are sort of secretly disappointed and the women are absolutely confident that that was a myth, so that wasn't a problem. But the reality is it is a myth. What happens is that your brain size is very much proportional to your body size and on average, men have larger bodies than women. That doesn't mean that any one woman isn't larger than any one man. Of course there are examples of that. But it does mean that, on average, men are, have bigger bodies and therefore they have bigger brains. In this graphic, which by the way is not done to scale, uh, you can see this across species, right? We go from a cat brain all the way up to an African elephant, and if I had made them to scale, um, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to even see the cat brain next to the African elephant brain because they're, they're just so much bigger. Um, but the reality is it scales very well with body size. So with that as kind of a little bit of a background um, in terms of thinking about, um, th thinking about the, uh, the, the brain as a basis, the question that we want to ask, and the promise of consumer neuroscience, is whether neuroscience can provide privileged in insight into consumer behavior. That's what we want to be able to do, right? So let's talk about the very first example of this that got so much attention in 2004, which had to do with um, what's often called the Pepsi Challenge, right? So many of you probably know, but Coke has somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of the market share for dark brown colas, right? Um, and it has for a very long time, um, where the main competitor here is, is Pepsi. Now, for many, many years, Pepsi spent a lot of time and money and effort doing R&D in their, in their labs, trying to make their sweet little brown syrup taste more like Coke's sweet little brown syrup, so that people would buy Pepsi more. And for years and years and years and tens of millions of dollars of R&D later, really nothing had changed. In the 80s, someone from their marketing team decided to create what they called the Pepsi Challenge, which was they went to malls in the United States and set up tables where they had these bottles of, of cola that they had sort of covers on, and they allowed people to do blind taste tests. So they'd ask people before they uh, had anything. They'd say, well, what do you drink? Do you drink Coke? Do you drink Pepsi? What? And they would consistently get about three quarters of the people saying, I'm a Coke drinker, and another one quarter who said, no, I'm a, I'm a Pepsi drinker. And they'd say, great, well, we'd like you to try these and just tell us which one you like best. And they were unmarked. And people said, sure, I can always tell Coke, no worries. What they found was about 
60% of the people chose the Pepsi. Um, even though many of them, a, a majority of them, were self-professed Coke drinkers and who would say that they could always tell Coke and they would only ever drink Coke. But when they were deciding solely based on the taste, actually the majority of people prefer Pepsi. And this was both a good and a bad insight. I mean, it was bad in the sense that it indicated that the problem um, wasn't about the sort of sweet brown syrup. We didn't really need to spend tens of millions of pounds trying to make the syrup different um, if you're Pepsi, because the syrup's already better when decided based on taste alone. The problem was one of branding. Coke has outstanding branding, and they have thoroughly beaten Pepsi in this market in that area. So that was an important insight um, that changed the way Pepsi was thinking about it, its product and how to, to market its product, for instance. Now, what was really interesting, as I said, this was in the 80s and it was purely behavioral. <clears throat> um, in the early 2000s, a group in Texas, in Baylor, um, in Texas, um, came up with an MRI version of this experiment to see what was happening in people's brains when they did the Coke Pepsi challenge. So this is an MRI scanner. This is the one uh, in my building. Um, so I just grabbed a shot of it. But you can imagine already that this is going to be a weird environment for doing taste testing. First of all, you're going to have people lying on their back. Um, they certainly can't bring metal cans in there. So it's going to be a challenge. And even just drinking from your back is a challenge because it's easy to drown. Um, but what this group in Texas did that was really clever was they developed a system where they could, um, where they could have a, a little plastic tube inserted into someone's mouth that could give a small squirt of, of either Coke or Pepsi that the person could then hold in their mouth, taste, and then swallow. Um, and then when they were ready, they would get a, a little squirt of water to wash their mouth out. Um, and then the whole process could start again. At the same time, they were actually shown information on the screen that allowed them to see whether or not it was a, it came from Coke or it came from Pepsi or they were given a blank piece of information, blank can, so that it wasn't clear whether it was, you know, which it was. And of course, people then rated um, how much they liked it. And what was, um, what was really interesting was that there was a, a difference between the way people responded to the taste of what they drank versus the branding information. So that is to say, shown here on the left, and hopefully my cursor will show up so you can see it. Um, this is part of the medial prefrontal cortex. And this area increased in activation according to how much people liked it. So if you liked it more, there was more activation here. You like it less, there was less activation here. And that was independent of whether or not you thought it was Coke, Pepsi, or had no information. In contrast, this area here on the right is what's known as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And it, to some extent, these names don't mean that much. I'm going to use them so that you've heard them, but I don't expect you to necessarily remember all of the you know neuroanatomy names. But with dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this was an area that showed strong response to Coke branding, but very little response to Pepsi branding. And what's fascinating is, in addition to this area of prefrontal cortex, this neocortex that's this evolutionarily new bit in your brain, um, you would also see parts of what's called the limbic system associated with both memory and, and, and emotion. And what the author said was, that their study allowed them to differentiate between what was happening from a pure perceptual level, how much you valued this based on its taste, versus what you know in terms of the brand associations. And you could see this play out in different parts of the prefrontal cortex, different parts of the human brain. Now, to their surprise, um, this was received really, really strangely. I mean, there were consumer groups in the United States that um, essentially protested and said that they had discovered the buy button in the brain and that by doing this, they were going to allow corporate America to make um, consumers into mindless buying zombies um, by somehow making things so appealing to this buy button that people wouldn't be able to resist. Um, I think that caught the, the scientists themselves a bit off guard. Um, it turns out it's, it's complete and utter nonsense, but it did reflect a certain amount of zeitgeist in the community. People were anxious about this because this idea that you could peer in and get privileged access to what was happening in the brain was brand new, right? And it seemed to offer all sorts of potential for both learning, genuine value, but also potential misuse. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go along today.
One of the things that was really important about this was that this was a study that was done by neuroscientists. It was done very well as a, it had all of the you know, criteria that constitute a good study. It was published in a, a reputable journal and subject to peer review. So, you know, one of the things that you look out for in terms of good science on these things are that they are done with good science teams, often in collaboration with good marketing teams, um, and that they go through the whole process of scientific validation. It's not something that's just done ad hoc um, by somebody who may or may not have a degree. Now, that example that I gave you relied on um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which is that big scanner and they're not very mobile. It's a very unnatural sort of environment to use. Another neuroimaging method is something called electroencephalography or EEG, it's normally what we refer to it. And you can see it here in this certainly stylized image. Um, it's basically a kind of a swimming cap with electrodes on top. They're not normally lit up like that. That just made this picture look cool. Um, and it's a much more portable environment because you can walk around with this. Now, it's still not really very portable because as you can see, you look a little weird and you've got wires coming off your head, etc. But nonetheless, this is something that can be used to measure electrical activity in the brain, your brain waves, and you can use that to try to understand what's going on in the brains um, of your consumers, for instance. So, one of the things that I mentioned in the beginning was whether or not I could use imaging to predict the outcome of elections. I haven't done this, but my colleague Julia Golley at University of Kingston here in, in London has, and she did it in particular with the Brexit election, um, the referendum, when, um, when she looked at a number of different people's responses to statements about Brexit. So what she did was she recruited a set of um, Remainers, people who wanted to stay in Europe. She recruited a bunch of Brexiteers or Leavers, people who wanted to leave Europe. And then she also recruited a, a set of people who were undecided um, two weeks before the election. So she had these three groups. And what she did was she played them um, sentences, one word at a time, like the sentences here, um, while recording their brain activity using EEG caps of the sort I just showed you. So, for instance, you would see a sentence like, free access to health care for all EU migrants should be allowed. Clearly, that is a pro-Remain statement, right? The word It wasn't until the word allowed came, because if, if the word had been disallowed, it would have been a lever statement. But the nice thing about this is that the last word in the sentence determined whether the whole sentence was a Remain sentence or a leave sentence. Um, similarly, if Britain leaves Europe, our quality of life will be enhanced. That's a Brexiteer sentence, right? Um, if the last word were degraded, then that would be a remain sentence. So there were equal numbers of these sentences that could have gone either way, right? And it wasn't until the last word is encountered that you, you discover whether or not it's a remain or a leave sentence. Depending on whether you're a remain or a leaver, you get, are surprised by the last word. So for instance, if you are a Brexiteer, you firmly believe that we should have left uh, Europe as we have, then free access to healthcare for all EU migrants should be allowed. Allowed is a surprise. You, your brain gets there and says, whoa, that wasn't what I was expecting. And that can be measured in something called an N400, right? So this is part of your brainwave activity. And these plots that you can see here in orange and purple are um, electrical activity to the different types of sentences. So for instance, if you intend to, to vote remain, that is, you are a remainer, and you see a sentence that's like a leave sentence, if Britain leaves Europe, our quality of life will be enhanced, it's clearly not what you'd expect, then you have greater activity, a higher line here in the orange than the purple, um, about 400 milliseconds after the last word appears on the screen. That's why it's called a 400. It's called an N400 because this is actually a, a negative deflection, these plots are a little bit strange. Everything's upside down, but negative is up and positive is down. So this has become more negative. Okay. The key here, that's why it's an N400. Um, the key here is that this N400 paradigm is something that's very good at detecting when you're surprised by a sentence, right? So in some level, it was no surprise that remainers show N400 effects for leave statements, the ones that they don't expect. Similarly, leavers show um, N400s for remain sentences. You know, 
that, that doesn't fit their worldview. That was just a, essentially a baseline way of estimating, you know, truth. But what was interesting here was what happens in the people who were undecided. And what Julia Gali was able to show was that if you measured the N400s in those people, then that predicted the way they actually voted in the referendum better than what they said they were going to do when they're voting. They had all said they didn't know, but she was able to accurately predict in something like 65% of the um, um, participants, which is better than chance, although not hugely better than chance in this case, um, the way they would vote based on these implicit measures of their brain response. So that is, you know, let me try to say that in another way. Even though these people either didn't know or claimed they didn't know how they were going to vote, Golly was able to measure their brain activity to these very simple sentences and based on that was able to accurately predict how the majority of those people would vote in the referendum. So this is clearly a case of being able to use a brain imaging technique to get information that you couldn't get out of just simply asking people. I've talked about MRI, I've talked about um, EEG, and those are both brain measures, but there are also like other ways of, of using kind of psychology and neuroscience tools to try to get at information. And this is a study that, that uh, we ran in my group um, in conjunction with Audible who came to us at one point and, and said, look, does it actually matter the way you, act, the, you receive a story? So if you're interested in the Game of Thrones books, does it matter whether or not you watch the HBO adaptation or read the books or listen to it as an audiobook? Does that affect the way you interact with the story? And we thought this was a really interesting question, particularly in terms of how much it affects your uh, emotional engagement, right? And thought, well, this is a... This is an interesting enough question that it makes sense to actually try to, to measure this. And the way we did that was um, we designed an experiment where we took scenes from eight different stories, the, the books that are shown here on the screen. These books were chosen partly because they span lots of different genres um, and therefore they're very different types of story. But in all cases, they had an audio version of the book but there was also a video adaptation that was more or less true to the story. So in case some cases, I'm sure you're familiar, you know, when you move a book to a, to a movie or a video, you, you change the story quite considerably. One of the things we tried to make sure was that when we chose the specific emotional scenes that we used for this experiment, those scenes were as close as possible uh, in the book and, in the, and in, the, um, in the video, so that we were comparing like with like. Right. And what happened was we had participants come into the lab and we would put on something that's very much like a Fitbit. It's a watch that allows us to measure their biometric responses, things like their heart rate and their galvanic skin response. And what's exciting about those physiological biometric responses is that they provide a subconscious um, insight into cognitive and emotional processing in people. Right. So in addition to asking them what they think and feel about these stories, we were also as able to measure implicitly what they think and feel about these stories, basically from this biometric device on the wrist. And it's very non-intrusive or anything. It's really very much like, um, um, like a, a watch, if people forget it. So what would happen is people would come in and they would get four of these stories as audio stories, just one scene from each, and then four of them as videos. And of course, a different subject would come in and get like the opposite pattern. So it wasn't it wasn't the case that you only ever heard Silence of the Lambs as a book and not as a video. You but no one person got it in both formats. Okay. And what we did was we then measured their explicit and implicit engagement with these stories. And as I said, okay, so here's the the device. This is um, what's called an E4 biometric watch. And um, in addition to measuring heart rate, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with from your sort of Apple and Samsung and Fitbits. Um, this also measures something called galvanic skin response, which is essentially a measure of emotional arousal. So it's um, a way to measure what's called the autonomic nervous system response that you get whenever you're in an emotionally engaged situation. It can be positive, it can be negative, so you could be really happy or you could be really angry or really scared, but no matter what, you produce the same kind of um, skin response that you can see here, you know, in terms of goosebumps, and it actually causes contraction in your skin that increases perspiration as well, and that's actually what it's really literally measuring. 
Um, and what was, you know, we then tested about 100 participants, um, and the results were surprisingly clear, actually. When we asked people, just how much do you explicitly um, rate audiobooks versus vis uh, videos, then the clear hands-down winner were videos, right? So when people, people said they paid more attention to the videos, so in blue relative to the red here, so attention, as you can see, is higher. People were found the narrative more engaging for the videos than the, than the audiobooks. People identified with the main character slightly more, although this wasn't significantly different, but still it was higher for videos than for uh, audiobooks. And they thought that they were, they were more present in the story for the videos than the audi audiobooks. So in other words, this is not the kind of results that uh, Audible were certainly hoping for. Um, and they were very strong. These were really robust results. I mean, people rated the videos more, uh, more highly than they rated the audiobooks. What was fascinating, though, was that there was a really different pattern um, when you looked at the implicit physiological responses, right? So this isn't what people say. This is what we were able to measure from their physiology. And what we find was that, on average, people's heart rates were about two beats a minute higher for audiobooks than for videos. And let's just think about that for a second. These are people who are sitting on their butt in a room not doing anything. It's not like there's any activity occurring <laughs> that would um, make them physically more active in one case or another. So the fact that you're getting greater heart rate is a really strong indication of greater cognitive and emotional engagement. And I'll return to that in a, in a second. One of the other things that was fascinating was that the heart rate variability was higher. That is, there were higher highs and lower lows when you were listening to the audiobooks than when you're watching the videos. This is an indication of something that's known as emotional amplification, um, and it's a, a very well-known phenomenon, but it suggests that, you know, you're responding more to these, uh, to these changes in the narrative structure. So as the story gets really exciting, your heart it goes up higher. As it relaxes and the story uh, wanes a bit, your heart rate even goes lower. And that um, liability in the heart rate is actually another indication of greater emotional cognitive involvement. We saw the same pattern in terms of the galvanic skin response. Here I'm just calling this electrodermal activity, but they mean the same thing. Again, the terms don't really matter that much. This is a measure of um, uh, an indirect measure of emotional arousal. And surprisingly, there's even a small difference in temperature. That is to say, people's body temperatures are slightly higher when they're listening to the audiobooks than watching the videos. Um, this is kind of interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it here today just for lack of time. But one possibility could be that, you know, I said that what's going on here is that people are sitting down, they aren't moving. But if you recall from the previous slide, it was the case that people said they attended more to the video than the audiobooks. So it's possible that maybe they were moving and just in terms of fidgeting or something like that. And if they were fiz fidgeting and moving, it could be the case that their heart rate and their body temperature and things like that could go up based solely on the movement. But it turns out these watches also measure the amount of physical movement, acceleration at the wrist. And in fact, there was no difference there whatsoever between the, the two conditions. So that wasn't it. In other words, what we're seeing is that these implicit measures suggest that people are engaging with the stories more when they're in an audio format relative to a video format. We can talk about why that might be a little bit, um, and I'll do that very briefly, but I'm also aware I'm kind of getting on in time, so I want to start to bring things to a close here. Um, this is just a brief illustration. Aria began to climb. Her broken thumbnail left smears of blood on the painted marble but she made it up and wedged herself in between the king's feet. That was when she saw her father. Lord Eddard stood on the high septon's pulpit outside the doors of the sept, supported between two of the gold cloaks. Um, at this point, um, you probably recognize that this is a scene from Game of Thrones, and what's happening... Let me see if I can get this version going. It's, it's too slow to do it in real time, so I'm going to speed it up. Um, and see... Okay, I'm going to turn that sound off. But what's happening is this is a 10-minute scene, and you can see, on average, in the group, that the electrodermal activity for the audiobooks, shown here in the top plot, 
tends to be higher than the, what's happening for the video, although it does cross over at times. Similarly, the heart rate stays higher and the body temperature stays higher over this whole scene. And we can map it out and you can see that um, what's going on is that by having to co-create the content, right, by imagining the story, the voices, the etc., you know, the scenery, the action, the, the person who's listening is actually doing more work than someone who's watching a video. Now, watching a video isn't a completely passive process, but it is far more passive than either reading the story or listening to the audiobook. When you engage with it in that extra level and you generate the internal imagery, then you're doing more work, which means that you, we can measure this in terms of um, your physiological responses. Now, why does, if that's the case, why do people think that they, they like the videos better? Well, the reality is probably this is partly related to the way we tested. We had people sitting in a quiet room that was sound attenuated by themselves, so it was quite a boring environment other than the story. But with the video, you had some place to put your eyes, right? You were watching the screen. Whereas for the audio, it's different. You're, um, you really have no place for your eyes, and people find that distracting because then their eyes are off doing other things, and therefore they feel like they're not paying as much attention. In real life, um, the, the reality is that when people listen to audiobooks, they tend to multitask, right? I mean, they often are driving or doing laundry or chores or something else, running, whatever it is they're doing. Um, and therefore, that's less of an issue because the story is the part where they're engaging their mind. The other things are just the things that they're doing that are keeping them active. So again, there's this real disconnect between what we can learn from um, physiology and what we can learn from just simply asking people. I don't want to go through that again. The last thing I want to show is um, a study that we ran um, in a very, very weird environment. Right, so Desperados is this um, beer that includes sort of uh, tequila in the beer. Um, some of you may have even had it. But every year they run a huge party for basically the biggest social influencers in Europe. Um, and the, the point is to sort of create the Desperados lifestyle. Uh, last year, or maybe two years ago at this point, I'm getting my time mixed up. Um, they did this in Venice at the world's deepest pool, and you can see some of the video for, for this event. It was wild. Um, but what they wanted from us, and I'll just replay that, um, was a, a question of like whether or not living this Desperado's lifestyle could make you more creative. Now, this is not an environment that's well suited to MRI scanners or EEG or even Fitbits. So this is something where we use basic sort of behavioral psychology kind of paradigms where in addition to um, in addition to these crazy social media influencers, we could just bring in iPads and do some basic testing with them, right? So what we did was um, we gave them various tests of creativity. So one of them is called the alternate uses test, and we sort of say, think of as many uses as you can for an empty bottle of Desperados and then just write them all down in this iPad. And then you have another question called remote associates, which is what word goes with all three of these, cream, skate, and cube. And then there's also a drawing task, complete this figure. Now what we did was um, we tested half of these people before the party began, the day before, and on these materials. And that gave us about a hundred, sorry, I think it gave us about 60 people. Um, the other half we tested during the party but before they had had anything to drink. Now, the, one of the weirdnesses of this particular party was you could see from that pool, people had the opportunity to go like deep diving into the pool all the way down to the bottom and like dance 40 meters down uh, with sound and lasers and crazy bubbles and all the rest of it. But in order to make that safe, they were always escorted by professional divers and none of them were allowed to drink before they came up from that experience. So what would happen is they would come up and then we would get a chance to test them um, before they've had a chance to have any booze whatsoever. So the creativity differences that we may be able to see in this are about the environment, not about the fact that they've been drinking booze. And what you find is that um, on average, people were, were very, uh, did, did increase their creativity for, for two types of creativity and not the third. So that is to say, you know, for the alternate uses, which is a type of um, divergent 
uh, creativity, that is, come up with as many different things as you can. People were better able to come up with different answers, like blow over it to make a whistle. Or in the drawing task, which is another measure of divergent creativity, they came up with these great new pictures, the sort like this. But for convergent creativity, that is sort of problem solving, trying to come up with a creative solution that solves a problem, like recognizing that ice is the word that brings together ice cream, ice skate, and ice cube, um, they weren't any better. And you can see that here in the results. So before is in green, after is in yellow, and you can see after they've been in this party for a little while, but before they've had anything to drink, they were more creative in terms of divergent creativity for both the alternate uses and the drawing task. Whereas for convergent um, creativity, that is problem solving kind of creativity, it didn't make any difference whatsoever. So in other words, the results from this crazy environment, but a very real world environment, um, allow us to demonstrate that there is a measurable difference on creativity from being in this kind of a, a wild creative environment. Um, and at some level that's not hugely surprising, it's consistent with things that we've seen in the literature before, but still being able to use these kind of tools in psychology and neuroscience and able to ask these questions that you couldn't ask just by simply saying, hey, do you feel more creative or not? Because who knows whether that's meaningful. Um, we can get at in a meaningful scientific way through these kind of approaches. So I want to stop there and uh, we'll take a break at this point. We'll give everybody a chance to, uh, to catch their breath and um, I will make the second half of this lecture available shortly thereafter. Um, thank you very much.